Hey, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to our NSS Space Forum. On behalf of Larry Ahern, Vice President of Chapters, I'm Bert Dicht, Managing Director of Membership, and we're glad you could join us for Commercial LEO Space Stations uh, and the NASA Commercial LEO Destinations Program. I think you're really going to enjoy the session this evening, and we had a great, great response. So as always, we'd like to welcome you to the Space Forum. Happy New Year. This is our first Space Forum of the year, and we're putting together a great program. I'll share some of the upcoming Space Forums in just a minute. So as always, I'd like to just go over a little bit of our virtual etiquette. I'll have a few NSS announcements. Then we'll talk about what's coming up with Space Forums, and then we'll get right into the program and then we'll have a closeout uh, toward the end. So as always, if you are gonna submit a question, uh, we prefer you to use the Q&A function because that can be seen directly by the panelists and it's not mixed up with some of the other uh, information that's out there. Uh, so it works a little better if you do that. Uh, to comment, uh, use the chat function. Uh, you know, as always, be respectful of the panelists and the audience. Uh, I will make sure the chat is working. I know sometimes we've had a little glitch with that, so I'll get that as soon as we're done this, uh, and we'll make sure it's all up to speed for you. We did get a lot of questions that were submitted prior, so we're going to try to get to as many of them as possible, and then, but feel free to submit your questions as we move along as well. As always, we'd like to encourage you to give to our cause. If you're enjoying the programming like these space forums and town halls, please donate to support National Space Society. Uh, we are a not-for-profit organization. Uh, we thank you for your membership. That's how we do a lot of what we do, but also we appreciate those who contribute uh, to our cause. I will post that link uh, into the chat once we start. And also, if you uh, enjoyed the session afterward, please take a few moments uh, to complete the post space forum survey. It only takes a couple of minutes. Uh, it's, it's anonymous. It'll take you right to it once we're done. And your feedback really is helpful in us planning future events. So what's coming up with our space forums? We're working to try to get uh, a great, great program for you. So as you know, today we're doing the commercial LEO space stations. Uh, coming up next week, we've actually put in a new a session. We're trying to go every two weeks, but we've had a great opportunity to have uh, a special session on India's Skyroot suborbital launcher. Uh, the India, of course, has a very, very vigorous space program. And this is a privately funded suborbital launcher that successfully launched uh, in November. So it'd be great to hear an additional perspective on that. Coming up two weeks from tonight, we have a session on space debris. February 9th, we've got 200 years of space tourism. Uh, on the 23rd, you'll be hearing from our space health contest winner. Uh, March 9th, we've got space for a better world and March 23rd, Space Solar Power. Uh, and you can see there are quite a few sessions in the queue that we're working on, life support, security, uh, a, a real fun session on the science of Star Trek, uh, also a web space telescope update. And also we're gonna get a couple of space photographers uh, to share and talk about their photography through the years of, of taking photos of launches. So we've got a lot planned. We hope to get uh, April set up. And then, of course, as we move into May, we've got the International Space Development Conference. You'll be hearing more about that uh, in future sessions. But look for the invitations as we send them out. We post them on social media as well. And uh, when we send out a copy of this presentation as it's recorded, we'll include that update as well. So again, thanks, everybody, uh, for uh, being part of this. I think it's now time to to get into our program. And judging from the great response we have, this is a very, very interesting topic uh, about commercial LEO space stations and also the LEO destinations program that NASA had. Uh, you're gonna be hearing from five different speakers. Uh, we're not gonna take time to, to do complete introductions. You have their bios, 
They're very, very impressive uh, speakers, and they are all NSS space ambassadors. Uh, I would also like to point out tonight who are joining us on the panel, we have uh, Dale Scran, our NSS COO, and also Stephen Ackerley, who is the chair of the NSS Space Ambassadors. So they are also part of this. So I will be introducing uh, Jim Plaxico first, but we also have Ken Ruffin, uh, Vanessa Farsadaki, uh, Mark Armstrong, and also Pramesh uh, uh, Baraparte. So we're looking forward to a great, great session for tonight. Uh, Jim, I'm gonna turn it over to you to get these uh, festivities going. Great, thank you very much, Bert. So let me do my screen share and hopefully everyone is seeing the NASA's Commercial LEO Destinations Program title slide. And just to start, uh, I'd like to say that the NASA Commercial LEO Destinations Program is really an excellent way for the US to move forward from the ISS program, because while it meets NASA's needs, it simultaneously uh, is encouraging the development of a commercial LEO economy. So ISS has been supremely successful in advancing our ability to conduct sustained operations in outer space. But on the other hand, it's not really uh, economical and it is approaching the end of its life. ISS is set to terminate in 2030. The big question is, how will NASA and the nation move forward from ISS and continue to move forward? One thing should be clear, NASA lives in an era of increasing budget pressure. The budgets for Artemis, Lunar Gateway, and SLS really leave no room for any major new projects. Uh, ISS costs more than $100 billion to design, build, and deploy. Uh, and it should be clear that NASA will not get the funding it needs to build its own successor space station. And frankly, we should not want it to. One of the major uh, points of opposition to the space station project was its cost of operations, not to mention construction and assembly. Uh, the nature of ISS makes it a very uh, high cost operation uh, in terms of uh, annual operating budget and maintenance budget. So given that ISS is already beyond its projected 15 year life, Costs are likely to increase going forward, which will create even more budgetary pressures within NASA. But fortunately, we do have a better, more forward-looking option. Now, for me, the greatest unintended, or I should say unanticipated, uh, accomplishment of the ISS program was the acceptance and success of a wide a, li a wide variety of commercial uh, services and activities. And these commercial projects have really opened up the door to options and possibilities for NASA, as well as for space ventures. Now, it was the many commercial successes, uh, budgetary pressures, and national space policy that collectively led NASA to decide to pursue the purchase of space station services from commercial providers, rather than trying to build their own successor space station. Now, in anticipation of private astronaut crews visiting ISS, NASA back in 2021 established this pricing schedule. The relevance here is that this can be used as a benchmark of sorts against which to make both cost and price projections, as well uh, as market demand projections. And I would in particular call your attention to the charge for ISS crew time of 
$130,000 per hour. The Commercial LEO Destinations Program was announced in July 2021. And the nature of the call for proposals was very clearly outlined. At the top level, it was made clear that the program would be executed in two phases. Phase one, design proposals would be submitted by commercial entities for consideration. At the end of phase one, which is projected to be perhaps 2025, one or two of the proposals would be selected uh, to proceed to phase two with the result being one or two commercial space stations that would be active before the 2030 end of service state for ISS. NASA also laid out its overall goals for the project. Uh, I've highlighted in yellow those points that I found most interesting. Uh, NASA's goals can be summarized as having the ability to meet its own objectives while having uh, a degree of confidence that the commercial stations are going to be economically viable. The proposal also made clear how submissions were to be structured and how they would be graded when it came time to pick winners. NASA received a number of responses to their call for proposals. And back in December, 2021, a year ago, selected three who would receive Space Act agreements for phase one of the program. It is one or more of these three who will advance to phase two, which is expected to be sometime after 2025. Now for NASA, the success of the program is critical. First, because of the anticipated cost savings associated with procuring commercial services in a market environment. Uh, and if you look at this chart here over on the right, you will see the projected savings uh, area in green, which do appear to be fairly significant. Second, because these platforms will be the replacement for ISS, which is what serves as NASA's technology test bed, and as an ongoing experiment for human presence in space, these platforms are really uh, essential to NASA being able to continue to fulfill its mission. Now, the one thing that's clear from the design of the CLD proposal is that NASA sees itself as just one customer of many. The great unknown at this point is whether or not the market for space station services is sufficiently large that it will be able to generate the revenue necessary to cover the operational costs of a commercial space station. And this chart here from market study, though it is five years old, demonstrates the degree of uncertainty in the size of the market and consequently the financial risk associated with operating uh, a private space station. So recognizing the importance of this program, this was one of the Alliance for Space Development's uh, four key objectives during this year's, or excuse me, last year's 2022 March storm in which advocates such as myself met with staffers from key offices in both the House and the Senate to stress the importance of this program. Now, at this time, I'm going to pass the microphone over to Ken Ruffin, who will talk to you about Axiom's work, which though not a part of the commercial LEO development proposal, is another commercial space station project that NASA had previously uh, entered 
into an agreement with. So I will stop sharing my screen and turn control over to Ken. Hi, Jim, thank you very much. As I start to share my screen. And just a moment. Okay, uh, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, Axiom Space. Um, can someone acknowledge whether or not they can see it? Yep, we see it. Wonderful. Okay, so uh, Jim, thanks for the introduction. I'm Ken Ruffin, chapter president for the NSS of North Texas host chapter for ISDC 2023. Um, several of the chapter members are on and, and other friends, so hello to all of you. I will proceed. Uh, my table of contents, this is a, a unique table of contents for me because I'm li limited in time. I'm going to do a brief intro and then as you see questions from a book report you may have written at some point, who, what, where, when, why, and how. And um, my references are axiomspace.com unless otherwise noted. So intro, Axiom Space is developing one of the options, as Jim said, for space station in low Earth orbit, intended to eventually replace ISS, and it's being built by a commercial spaceflight company, Axiom Space. Um, it has already begun a series of missions of increasing complexity. Last year, there were four civilian astronauts, the first uh, four all civilian mission to ISS was last year, and I'll, I'll talk more about that later. They began conducting microgravity experiments. Um, these are experiments different from the ones which have been conducted on ISS since November 2nd of 2000. The purpose of these experiments are for products which are intended to ge generate revenue um, for the company as well as uh, to benefit humanity. So co-founders uh, for this company that started in 2016, uh, you see the names here, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the people um, in particular in the leadership team, you may recognize as former astronauts and even uh, the last name there is the former NASA administrator, Charlie Bolden. So the what, Axiom Space is, uh, this is from their website, um, making the possibilities of low Earth orbit accessible to visionary governments, researchers, manufacturers, and individuals. Um, and there, well, you're going to see the different parts um, after people are flown, af after astronauts are flown to ISS to conduct experiments. The idea is one module at a time will be launched to low Earth orbit connected to ISS. And over time, from one module to two, to three, to four, and eventually, um, by the time ISS is decommissioned, there will be this Axiom station will be a freestanding station or free orbiting station. Um, one module, just to give you an idea of the size, 11 meters by 4.2 meters diameter or 36 feet by 14 feet. Um, think about if it's a the equivalent of a room on earth um, with an eight foot ceiling and then 15 feet by 15 feet length by width, approximately that size. So where orbit of ISS, um, 2008 is where, when this graphic was made, but nothing's changed. Um, it's that inclination as the earth, of course, rotates underneath the round earth. Uh, when I mentioned the four civilian astronauts, one is a former NASA astronaut, but these um, four gentlemen were launched to ISS on a Falcon 9 rocket Crew Dragon capsule, the Axiom Mission 1, back on March 30th of 2022. And photo from inside the Crew Dragon. Um, Axiom Mission 2 is scheduled for May of 2023. Peggy Whitson, former NASA astronaut, is the commander, former shuttle commander. Um, and John Schaffner is a pilot, and there are two other um, 
Axiom Astronauts to be announced. And of course, it's a uh, Crew Dragon, like I said, on the Falcon 9 launching from Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center. So conduct, conduct extensive research, as I mentioned. Uh, Axiom Mission 3 is scheduled for December of 2023. None of those Axiom astronauts have been announced yet. You see the cost, $52 million uh, for an eight-day mission to ISS. And I think there's $52 million per person. Now, I mentioned the modules. This is AXH1. This is Axiom Habitat 1 um, graphics, of course, scheduled to launch in 2024. This will um, house four astronauts, again, connected to ISS initially. And here's a photo of the interior, thanks to a suggestion from, I believe it was Jim Plaxco to add some interior photos um, and interior design by the French de designer, uh, Philippe Stark. And if there are any uh, Marvel Studios fans, you might not be surprised that it was a Stark that had a hand in this. All right, another photo from inside the interior. Okay, Habitat 2 um, will be able to house a total of, of eight astronauts, four in each, twice the volume for research and experiments. And again, both initially attached to ISS. And then AXL, this is the L as in logistics, the multi-purpose logistic module. So this will be intended for um, specifically for experiments and, and uh, products to be manufactured. Um, and I'll mention it later, uh, additive manufacturing, 3D printing, and more. Okay, AXPT, this is the power tower. So you see the part of the solar panel at the top for generating electricity. Um, the idea is that this would generate an equivalent amount of electricity that ISS currently generates, which is about 205 kilowatts of electricity, about 205,000 watts. And the complete Axiom station uh, by 2028, which is at least one of the tentative dates that I've heard for the retirement of ISS, so it's to be determined. So here's the timeline showing, starting from ISS on the left to the Axiom station in 2028 um, on the right. So why, I, I, this is from their site, Axiom Space believes microgravity is the most promising environment for innovation and problem solving since the internet. Humanity's next step starts with Axiom Space, their website. And uh, this is the manufacturer of, of those um, Axiom modules, certainly at least the first two and they're designed to be launched, and I've got to thank my fellow panelists for this. Um, these modules are designed to be launched by any of a variety of rockets currently capable or very soon to be capable of launching uh, payloads to low Earth orbit, payloads of the mass of one of these modules. And I mentioned additive manufacturing. Um, what I found the most fascinating about these Axiom experiments is the idea of 3D printing human organs in microgravity, um, which they can be uh, printed more, um, I guess, more efficiently, more accurately in microgravity than they can on Earth, um, using the, the donor patient's own tissues, which minimizes the risk of rejection of that organ. So something certainly to look forward to. Uh, something else really fascinating is this um, experiment that uh, where <laughs> the idea is that structures would automatically configure themselves or reconfigure themselves into different shapes in this particular image, uh, different shapes in Mars orbit with the Earth in the background, not necessarily that close, that could be a problem. And that's my last slide. So thank you very much. I will stop sharing. And I lost my notes for who the next presenter is. My apologies there. 
It's Vanessa. Ah, Vanessa is the, is the next presenter. Thank you. Very well. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Um, hello, everyone. So let's go ahead and share. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm in charge of telling you a little bit about uh, Blue Origin and what Blue Origin is doing um, in terms of uh, their uh, conceptual space station. Uh, I should state at the very beginning that uh, I do not represent Blue Origin in any way. I'm just really uh, happy uh, to talk about them because I'm a very big fan of what they do and their mission statement. Now, um, the Orbital Reef is um, quite well known, I think, to all space fans across the board. And if we talk about Orbital Reef, there's no way we cannot also talk about all these um, incredible companies that are really behind it. It's not just about Blue Origin. It's also about so many other companies that we're going to briefly mention as well. Now, uh, the website of Orbital Reef itself says that the, state, the mission is that the Orbital Reef will be the premier mixed-used space station in Leo for commerce, research, tourism, and all this by the end of this decade. So here, we're not only looking at um, only performing research or just having a destination for tourists. Uh, no, we're looking at this uh, consortium of companies and backgrounds that are going to offer uh, the ultimate experience in uh, a space station that we can have today. The Key players are mainly two. Firstly, Sierra Space. And Sierra Space is one of the main partners who will be providing the uh, large integrated flexible environment, life, in other words, uh, in other terms, modules. The node modules, um, the runway landing of the Dream Chaser, which I'm sure you've all seen, and I, I'm excited to show you a picture of that in a little bit. Um, and uh, it will be both for crew and cargo, uh, anything that comes with a Dream Chaser, for transportation, of course, and it will be capable of landing anywhere in the world. Now, Blue Origin, on the other hand, uh, will be providing uh, the vehicle for uh, the utility core systems, the large diameter modules, and the reusable heavy lift uh, New Glenn launch system. So if we were to put all the players together, uh, we would first talk about the Blue Origin um, then, of course, Sierra Space. Um, then we could also be looking at Boeing, Redwire Space, Genesis Engineering Solutions, and anything that will be um, research related would mainly go through ASU, Arizona State University. However, there are so many universities that are going to be supporting and collaborating uh, for the mission of this. Um, and I'm sure you can find <laughs> a lot of very uh, prominent uh, universities in this list. So um, if there's one thing to really remember about the Orbital Reef is that there's not just one company behind it. It's this uh, blooming result of uh, hard work uh, of various backgrounds and um, it's not just about one covering one need. It will be a destination for research, for cutting edge research, um, for commercial collaborations, but also a destination for tourists, uh, space tourism. Now, as quick facts about uh, this, um, the, the supported people will be uh, up to a number of 10, as it is estimated right now. 
The estimated habitable volume is 830 cubic meters. In comparison, the ISS um, is about uh, 390 uh, cubic meters. So we're more than doubling it. The expected operational date is 2027. The carrier rocket will be the new Glenn. Uh, the awards mainly was in 2021, as uh, Mr. Plaxco uh, mentioned earlier. Um, it was from NASA. Uh, they got awarded uh, $130 million. The status right now, it recently entered uh, the design phase. And the key elements are about research, tourism, and business. The really nice novelty about this is that we're talking about a futuristic space architecture, something really new, and uh, the space architects that are working on this are really cutting edge. Um, I should mention that I really love this uh, um, artist's um, design uh, right here because it has the dream chaser at at uh, the front right here. And you can see uh, where it uh, docks and uh, with the perspective, of course, with the orbital reef. Uh, a few pictures of uh, what it is predicted to look like. Uh, this is um, what uh, it would look like. It's estimated to be on multiple levels. Uh, and you can see there will be research levels, there will be uh, head, uh, living uh, quarters, and then another level um, for uh, growing uh, plants and uh, biological data in terms of uh, um, vegetation. Uh, vegetation. Um, this is also another conceptual image of what this might look like. And uh, just to give you uh, an aspect of the size of the inside, it's uh, quite quite different. I think we can all agree uh, compared to the ISS uh, because it's quite large and there's quite a bit of space to move around. Uh, so this is it from me. I will be more than happy to pass it on to um, Mr. Mark Armstrong uh, to, for him to discuss NanoRx. Thanks, Vanessa. How are you doing? And I really appreciate your presentation. It was very nice. I'm going to share my screen now and bring up a slideshow that I've prepared for you regarding NanoRx and Voyager Space Holdings. Now, NanoRx began operation in 2009. In 2019, the firm was brought into Voyager Space Holdings, CEO of which is Dylan Taylor, who's recognized as I guess you'd say a super angel investor in space development. Their $160 million funding from NASA has been the largest award in NASA's commercial LEO development program. Well, the founder of NanoRx, Jeffrey Mamber, um, served starting as a CAO from the first day, and he's been involved in quite a number of different uh, contributions to space development across uh, a wide range, large territory, from Russia back to the United States, the low Earth orbit, he is one of the pioneers that is most recognized in space development. What NanoRx has already done in low Earth orbit has had a great deal of impact. They developed the uh, Bishop Airlock, which increased the capacity of uh, oh, CubeSat launches and other operations to launch from the space station by a factor of five. They've launched a great many payload, uh, payloads to orbit, been involved in life science experiments, and with an eye towards future operations in low Earth orbit, they've carried out an experiment in cutting metal in the zero gravity environment. They were recognized by the IAF for the, um, for the creation of the Bishop Airlock. Here's where we're looking to the future. Nanorax, Voyager Space, and Lockheed Martin are partnering on what they call Star Lab. Star Lab, the commercial space station. Four crew, 340 cubic meters, 60 kilowatts, focusing um, in part on what they call the George Washington Carver Science Lab, also um, including um, a robotic arm for operations. And they're also looking at an estimated initial launch capability in 2027.
So NanoRacks has been working towards, you know, a private or commercial space station basically since day one. Um, I think like many others, and uh, looking at quotes like this is a reminder of how many people have been interested in commercial space station development. And it may seem, it kind of seems to me that NASA has picked the right time to, um, to support these developments. Voyager Space uh, CEO Taylor actually sees strong market opportunities, although there are many others that question whether that's the case. Um, they expect to begin manufacturing their first module in the third quarter of this year, and quote unquote, about a year to bending metal. One of the partners that they brought in just this last fall is Hilton. Hilton Hotels has signed on to design their astronaut facilities and also to explore the question of marketing astronaut experiences and stays aboard the, um, the Star Lab. This is the first uh, kind of partnership of this kind. Um, and uh, although uh, it's long been a passion of Hilton, Conrad Hilton uh, actually had people exploring the question of uh, the first hotel on the moon all the way back in the 60s, the first orbital hotel some years ago. Um, so I think Hilton has been a long time looking forward to taking part in space operations, hospitality in space. I mentioned the George Washington Carver Science Park. Um, NanoRax has been involved in life science experiments on the ISS and is looking forward to developing that further on StarLab, working with a number of different partners. They obviously are planning to make it very reconfigurable, very uh, open and flexible for the kind of projects that may be brought to them. Just in the last few days, Voyager Space picked up another important partner, Airbus announced an international partnership for future development of StarLab. Here's the Vice President of Space Systems at Airbus commenting on how important this partnership is from their point of view. This makes StarLab uh, very much an international project as Airbus brings in you know, the European partnership and I think we'll make the project a lot more likely to be successful, both you know, for European elements and for our partners here in the United States. That's not all, as they say. NanoRax is also working on what they call the outpost, commercial platforms in orbit, making use of wasted boosters, boosters that reach orbit being turned into useful uh, payloads by adding a bus system to achieve a great many flexible purposes for different kinds of uh, different kinds of customers. So imagine a future where an empty fuel tank or a booster can come back to life after completing its primary mission. No longer just space debris floating around in low Earth orbit, but now a facility for manufacturing, servicing, greenhouse, and more. Infrastructure as a service in the modern business sense. And this is, I think, kind of a sidebar to NanoRack's other project working with the NASA grant. Infrastructure as a service, sustainability and debris mitigation at the same time. So NanoRax kind of has a plan A and a plan B for low Earth orbit. And my guess is that both of them are gonna be very successful in the years to come. Now, I'm gonna turn it along over to Prath Mesh and thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I will, it was an excellent presentation and I will, Bid going ahead and sharing my screen. Um, can you can you stop presenting? Mark, you need to stop sharing. Right. Thank you. Okay. So. Uh, good morning. Uh, so good morning and good evening to everyone. Um, I'm Prathamesh and. 
I'm a mechatronics engineer, president for NSS Mumbai chapter and space ambassador for NSS. Uh, I'll be discussing more about Northrop Grumman's commercial space station, although they haven't named it uh, just like Axiom or anyone else. But uh, we'll be discussing, we'll start, we'll start with the introduction of Northrop Grumman, Northrop Grumman as a company. So Northrop Grumman is a leading global defense aerospace and has been currently uh, developing a commercial space station. The space station, the space station is designed to provide a platform for research and experimentation in microgravity conditions. The space station is modular in design, meaning it can be easily re reconfigured to accommodate multiple users. This is ideal for long-term missions and variety of research application. The design feature allows flexibility and scalability of the station and its user. Now, moving ahead, apart from utilizing for the utilizing it for a platform for research and experimentation in microgravity, the main purpose for the space station lies in uh, more than that. They have various aspects which they are focusing on, and few of them which they listed on the website is is more on habitation services, which allows people to work in work and live in space. Orbital manufacturing, which enables building in space, laboratory facilities for research, which helps in conducting disco discoveries in space, space tourism, which allows people to visit space, uh, educate and train, which helps in creating impactful message and shared space. This diversification in the use of the space station opens up various opportunities for different industries and field to conduct research, live and work in space and even open up space tourism for people. The facility, um, the facility they are providing, as size and capacity, Northrop Grumman Space Station is smaller in size compared to the ISS. It is planned, it, is, it has a planned capacity for to accommodate up to six people, while ISS can accommodate up to nine crew at a time, and it has maximum capacity of up to nine. Uh, sorry, minimum of nine, six crew and maximum of nine for ISS. This means that ISS has a greater capacity for crew members than the Northrop Grumman Space Station. But it's important to note that this may not be the only factor considering con to consider when comparing the space stations and their capabilities. Apart from that, the modularity of the space station. Uh, it is designed to be modular, meaning it can be easily reconfigured by adding and removing modules as needed. This allows for greater flex flexibility and the potential to expand or, or modify the facility as needed. The ISS is modular in design, but it's less flexible in terms of adding or removing modules. This means the Northrop Grumman Space Station has flexibility to adapt and change as per the requirement, while the ISS is limited to limited in this aspect. Location of the space, location of the commercial space station from Northrop Grumman. The Northrop Grumman space station is planned to be located in low Earth orbit, while the ISS is located in higher orbit. The difference in location could potentially impact the types of research that can be conducted on each each facility. For example, the lower orbit of the Northrop Grumman space station may provide more opportunity for observing the Earth's surface while the higher orbit of the ISS may be better suited for studying the effects of long-term space travel on the human body. Coming towards the timeline, it, uh, Northrop Grumman started planning the development for the commercial space station in early 20s. Uh, then they are expected to complete the early development work by late 2025 and the production for the stage one to end by late 2028. By 2030, they, uh, after, right after the parallel transition from ISS, the stage one is, is supposed to be in transition, it's supposed to be in operation. And parallelly, uh, there will be demos in ISS orbit for Cygnus spacecraft, as well as uh, they are additionally, they are also supplying Halo development modules to, for the Artemis missions. The stage one services. Stage one services, uh, they are providing a number of services like accommodating up to four permanent crew members for the stage one. 
The station will provide flexibility in terms of crew rotation schedule. Crew accommodation will include amenities for food, hygiene, medical needs, exercises, and essentials. The station will also have capability to host both internal pressurized payloads and facilities as well as external unpressurized payload. This allows for a wider rate range of payloads to be accommodated, including heritage payloads from the ISS as well as future payload systems. This feature provides a flexibility in terms of conducting research and experiments on the space station. Now, this was the image particularly shared by Northrop Grumman on, on one of their uh, sites. Uh, it shows the very first stage one element and the habitation modules A and B, as you can see it on the right and left, and the service modules and uh, Cygnus cargo vehicle, as well as uh, crew vehicle visiting uh, the Dragon crew vehicle and the compact telescoping array. Stage two services. Now, up, up, uh, right after the stage one has been deployed, uh, moving towards the stage two, the second stage two stage the second stage will provide provided by Northrop Grumman will include an increased volume and power capabilities. This will allow for the station to accommodate up to eight crew members. The station will also have four docking ports for docking of crew and cargo visiting vehicles. This will allow for the use of Cygnus spacecraft for cargo delivery, payload volume, trash removal, re reboost, and customized customer out outfitting of the PCM. The station will be compact compatible with uh, SpaceX Dragon and Boeing CST-100 crewed capsules uh, and will also have increased payload power capability. This will allow for more people to live and work in the space station, more cargo and payloads, and more power for the experiments and research. This stage of service provides more capacity and capabilities for the space, st space station to support more advanced mission and research. Apart from this, the future elements and capabilities of the space station includes a payload airlock to expand external capabilities and enable payloads to move in and out of the space station more easily. Uh, and ex external pallet for payload storage to provide more space for payload to be restored, the robotic arm for payload transfer and maintenance to allow more efficient movement of payload and maintenance of the station. The ability to add larger or specialized uh, pressurized modules, such as for tourism, deep space training, or manufacturing. An airlock for extra EVS, uh, which is which stands for extravehicular activities, to allow for crew members to conduct spacewalks. Multiple robotic arms for additional flexibility, which will increase the efficiency and ease of transfer and maintenance. Additional dock, docking ports to accommodate more spacecraft will allow for more vehicles to dock at the station and transport crew and cargo. These elements and cap capabilities will enable more advanced mission, more payloads and more opportunity for researchers and other users. They have shared a very specific uh, video about the space station, which I'll play here. And that's it from my end. I would like to pass this stage and hand over the stage to or, and the platform to Bert. Thank you so much. Hey, everybody. Uh, that was an amazing set of presentations. And we learned so much. And I think before we get into uh, all the questions, I think you saw the tremendous expertise that our NSS space ambassadors bring, uh, their depth of knowledge, the research they did, uh, really fascinating. And I'd like to start the first question uh, to Steven, 
uh, because a question came in to Q&A about the Space Ambassadors. So Stephen, could you tell us a little bit about the Space Ambassadors and what they, what they do and how someone might become a Space Ambassador? Yes, Bert, thank you. Um, first of all, uh, I wanna call attention to uh, the chat um, that has been running along with the, the presentations. It turns out that Jim Plaxco has included the link for the, the NSS webpage and the Space Ambassadors program. Uh, it's important to note that the Space Ambassador program is uh, a, an arm of educational arm of the NSS. And uh, you must be an NSS member uh, in order to be a space ambassador. Um, so all, all of the space ambassadors uh, are representing the NSS and uh, representing uh, the best of the information that we can get uh, for, for the space program. Um, and there is a broad selection of topics that the space ambassadors can talk to. Uh, there's, when you visit the webpage, you'll see a sampling of that. But certainly if you would like to have a presentation by any of our space ambassadors, uh, all you have to do is ask. And uh, there is a mechanism for asking for a presentation. So, uh, and we're all very willing to uh, make contact and make presentations. And we're all experienced at giving presentations to a number of audiences. So thank you, Bert. Appreciate the opportunity to do a commercial. Great. Uh, when we send out the recording link, we'll include some additional information about the Space Ambassadors uh, to everybody. So a lot to discuss. We've got a lot of questions that were submitted beforehand, a lot of questions that have come in during the session. Uh, and we just want to try to start to, to bring our ambassadors in and, and talk about some of these issues. So the first question, and uh, maybe I'll start with, uh, uh, with Jim, because he presented a, a number of numbers uh, that, uh, that NASA is working with. And there were several questions, Jim, about the uh, the business aspect, the, the the commercial aspects. You know, you know, is there a true business case for all of these commercial Leo's platforms? Uh, thank you, Bert. Actually, I would say yes, there is a business case. The challenge is given the demand models and they're something called price elasticity uh how much will the size of the demand be impacted by the prices that the stations have to charge to cover their annual operating costs as well as being able to uh, retroactively cover their development costs, as well as being able to pay back with interest uh, the money that they had to borrow in order to fund construction uh, of their stations. And where it gets really kind of tricky is with respect to the fact that right now we see a lot of uh, excitement for the development and deployment of commercial space stations. How many space stations uh, can the market support? And bear in mind, and this ties into one of the questions, that all of these stations uh, in order to qualify for phase two, there is a long list of NASA expectations or requirements that they will have to meet. So that's going to put some constraints on uh, how flexible they can be with design. For example, uh, the objective slide was they want permanent human habitation. That's great for space tourism, but 
is that really the best thing for a station that needs a very quiet microgravity environment for either UG research or if they're doing some type of space-based manufacturing operation, uh, a free flyer might be a better uh, solution uh, in that vein. So, and again, the price for private astronaut missions. So it remains to be seen um, whether or not the stations can be deployed at a a sufficiently low development cost and have really streamlined uh, operations and maintenance to keep that cost down. Like for one of the space station problems is astronaut time is very expensive and very limited. The astronauts spend a lot of their time just taking care of the space station. Commercial operators are gonna have to flip that on its head such that they spend most of their time doing actual productive work and very little time cleaning house. That's a really important distinction. I see that uh, our Dale has raised his hand. Dale, did you want to add something to that? No, I want to argue with uh, one point Jim made that um, he, he was talking about uh, borrowing money and I think a widespread misunderstanding uh, that people have about these kinds of projects uh, with startup companies is that the money is, I mean, sometimes it's borrowed, but rarely is it borrowed. It's equity financing. Axiom is getting equity financing. And the people putting in the money are not expecting interest payments. They own a part of Axiom. And they're basically taking a flyer on the idea that 10 years from now, Axiom will be worth a lot of money and they can sell their stock the way SpaceX could potentially sell stock in SpaceX, which is now a $100 billion company. And, you know, so th that, that means that there's a lot of pressure to have a big payout in the long run, but in the short run, you're not paying interest. That, you know, you just have to produce, you have to do what's called value creation. You have to demonstrate that in each round of funding, what you've done is worth more than it was and that means that every round of funding you have to add value for the, your investors and you know it's a tricky thing and not everybody succeeds but uh, that's my little uh, entrepreneurship lecture over thanks dale uh let me get into uh, the next question because we have quite a few of them uh this one i can open up to any of the ambassadors uh it came from uh some of our uh legal representation within nss and uh, obviously when you're building a building on uh, planet Earth, there are building codes involved. Now, obviously NASA's responsible for building a space station. You know, they're a government entity, but some of these private companies that maybe are doing things on their own, how is it all gonna be regulated? What kind of uh, rules and guidelines will they follow for the construction of these, of these space stations? Uh, so I don't know, uh, any one of our ambassadors want to try to tackle that question? Uh, in the uh, proposals document, there are a couple of NASA manuals that they reference uh, that have, uh, let's say, engineering expectations uh, that, because they don't want to put a NASA astronaut at risk. So they have, let's say, I'll, I'll call it a set of parameters that are expected uh, to serve as guides for uh, the commercial designers. Uh, and those documents are online as is the original uh, call for proposals. Uh, it's at a, a Johnson Space Center website. Uh, I actually, if you go back, I might, I included the name of the document. I don't think I included the link to where it's located, but it's part of the, it's part of the, uh, the government, the larger government procurement process. I think it's SAMTRAC uh, is the uh, domain uh, that is used for which 
you know, government solicitations and contracts are out there. Great, thanks, Jim. Anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, and Bert, <clears throat> I think yeah. I'd like to, to just comment that since NASA has provided seed money to, to Jim's point, uh, NASA has a series of expectations that they're gonna require uh, for these commercial space stations if they're going to use them. Now, the, the question comes uh, as we become smarter about building space stations in space, uh, what, what will evolve? What additional requirements and, and uh, other learning will, will occur? So we have a start, we have some experience, but it's going to expand. Thank you. Great. I know that right now on the International Space Station, there's that issue with the Soyuz spacecraft with its coolant leak. Uh, so there were a number of questions that came in about safety. And uh, for the ambassadors who talked about the different uh, programs from the different companies, uh, what did you see about uh, incorporating safety to make sure that these are uh, you know, safe places for people to operate, whether they are tourists, or professional astronauts. If I may, I'd like sure, I'd like to weigh in. Um, there's a really important puzzle piece uh, that is being implemented nowadays in all these all these companies across the board, and that is uh, the knowledge, the knowledge and the expertise that the people that they have on are bringing. Um, we have behind us all these incredible programs that were risky business <laughs> um, and we have learned a lot and uh, that knowledge coupled with uh, the new generation of um, education uh, for example, space law, because we mentioned that earlier, or space architecture, those kinds of things didn't exist 50 years ago. So uh, if we couple the experience we have had from the previous programs and missions with the new education that there is out there, that expertise that is born um, is what gives birth to safety, basically. Um, it is what is going to lead all these great companies that have brilliant minds behind them uh, to stay safe and not to make missions, suicide missions, but rather uh, provide this more or less safety. And of course, we're not, we're not there yet. That would be very um, <laughs> brave of me to say. Uh, but as we go through from generation to generation and we're building these, they are going to get better and better and safety is going to increase more and more. Uh, it was the same look back, right? History, look at uh, airplanes, how safe uh, were they at the very beginning? It was a flip of a coin, right? Um, now there are I mean, unless the FAA uh, crashes, uh, they uh, they they fly all the time. So uh, there's um, so much that we have learned and we respect the previous generations for, and we take that knowledge, we pair it with the education that we're being provided that is so much different and so novel. And there you have it. You have the state of the art cutting edge as safe as it gets today. Great, thank you so much. Oh, I see Ken, Ken did you wanna talk about that as well? Yes, um, <clears throat> I, I don't have details that I can provide, no inside information for Axiom Space and, and their, um, their approach to safety. However, they do have a chief safety officer who's a former three-time space shuttle astronaut, uh, Rex Walheim. So someone who, you know, certainly has been in space, someone whose life depended on um, engineers doing their jobs, whether it's with the, the rocket, with, uh, with the shuttle in that case, um, with um, ISS, 
He was on the last mission to ISS. Um, so the launch to IS, staying on ISS and the return to Earth. So I would think just because of the of the fact that you know he's not someone who who would just be you know here on Earth all his life researching and and so on and so forth, but someone who's actually lived that risk. Um, for what it's worth, that just gives me a little confidence that you know, whatever, whatever it is they end up doing, whatever decisions they make uh, will be based on that learned experience, not just from him, but the other astronauts that are leaders of their company as well. Thanks, Ken. Anyone else like to add on that or I'll go on to the next question. Let me do that then. Uh, in many of your presentations, you shared some of those uh, internal views of what these stations would look like. And they look a, obviously a lot different than the ISS, which looks like it, it's everything's in there, including the kitchen sink. When you look at some of those uh, in, interior shots of the ISS, uh, how are the designers uh, uh, approaching these new concepts. They're obviously the cases, uh, and it maybe in a way it touches on what, what Jim said about uh, turning the turning around that uh, they can't spend all their time uh, manage, managing the space station. They have to do work, but these interiors are actually designed to make them look more like homes in a sense. Uh, and maybe you could all comment on what you saw in terms of these and how designers are approaching this. Anyone want to tackle that one? <laughs> oh, um, Ken? Um, actually, Mark and Prathmesh had their hands up. Oh, did they? Uh, so... I did not see that. Okay, great. Uh, Mark, you want to go first? Well, they're very pretty, but it seems a little unrealistic to me to expect all the piping, all the wiring to be hidden behind bulkheads. I mean, it's it's a nice picture, but you know, you gotta be able to reach things very quickly when a problem arises. That, excellent point. Ramesh? Um, <clears throat> I did realize that the entire modules are probably, flex they are focusing more on the flexibility part and they were designed based on what they have experienced utilizing Cygnus spacecraft while sharing payloads to ISS back and forth. I mean, the exterior models do look like for the Northrop Grumman Space Station, which look like inspired from the Cygnus spacecraft. Great, thank you so much. Let me take a few questions uh, from the audience that were submitted uh, tonight. Uh, there is a question. I know. I know they were answered by some of our panelists uh, in writing, but just to uh, have everyone understand what was said or what was asked, Carl asked, "Was there any coordination, or will there be any coordination and cooperation uh, between the different companies?" And I know Vanessa, you you answered that. I don't know if you'd like to just uh, expand on that. Yes, sorry. Um, I was just going to um, send in the chat a comparison of uh, the interior of uh, the Chinese space station versus the American space station, because uh, apparently we don't know how to deal with piping. Um, so uh, yes, there is a collaboration. I thought that question was um, sent exactly the moment uh, we were talking about orbital reef. So I think uh, the question was uh, for the orbital reef. Um, and then the uh, yes, the, the answer is absolutely. Uh, in contrast to all the other um, space stations that are being uh, conceptualized and designed right now, um, the orbital reef uh, is uh, an absolute uh, consortium of companies. Um, it, uh, it, it, Blue Origin might be behind it, but it has done a brilliant job and it goes well with its mission statement, right? To, to make uh, space for everyone and really opening it up. And it really has done that. Uh, I mean, they realized that uh, they needed the expertise uh, 
of uh, Sierra and they took them on board. They made a collaboration. So now Sierra is part of some of the, uh, is in charge of some of the modules. Um, they realized that Boeing is brilliant uh, at building uh, some other things than they take on board Boeing. Uh, they knew that New Glenn was not sufficient and uh, the coupling with the Dream Chaser was brilliant. So they signed that on. So it's really, and, and then you have all the, the research that goes behind it and all the proposals that are going behind it that are not just um, for engineering. Uh, there are how do plants grow in space kind of questions that uh, the orbital reef is willing to look at, and they're already um, bringing on board uh, groups from labs from universities all around the world. So it's not just uh, commercial collaborations, let's just sign a piece of paper and make sure you have the wrench that I need and I have the wrench that you need. This is a lot bigger. It is international. It involves all kinds of backgrounds and it really will, will bring what space is all about, um, collaboration. So yes, they do collaborate. Great. There were a couple of questions that were submitted beforehand and also I saw tonight uh, about the life support systems that are going to be used. And I'd like to tie that into a question about, uh, you know, lessons learned. Uh, you know, the ISS has been occupied for 22, going on 23 years now, and I'm sure there are a lot of things that have been learned by uh, this long-term occupation of the International Space Station. So uh, in, in any of these designs that you've seen, uh, how do you see the technology advancing in terms of life support? How do you see the technology advancing in terms of, well, we talked about safety, but I, I, I think those are really important issues uh, if you're gonna maintain a, a presence in each of these space stations. Anybody want to try that one? Ooh, it's, I scared everybody away. Well, the fact that you have multiple. Uh, yep, go ahead. Structures. Yeah, I, I, was, was, I was going to say that um, I think what we're going to see initially is um, uh, the extension of the current life support systems used on the International Space Station. However, uh, there, there is a large community of, of people that are very interested in uh, the closed loop, loop life support systems. And you saw some evidence of that in some of the presentation slides where you saw vegetation growing on racks along the walls. This is, this is actually a very critical point uh, as we go further into space, because we need to take a lot of life with us. We are dependent on life. And whether we like to admit it or not, some of the life that we depend on is microscopic. And we need to provide an environment that is extremely supportive of all of that life if we're going to thrive and survive in space. So uh, that work is is ongoing and is extremely important, in my opinion. Thanks, Stephen. A couple of questions talked about our goals to go to, to back to the moon and to Mars. How does this LEO work uh, connect, if at all, to the intent to go to the moon and to Mars? Well, Bert, I have uh, a thought about that. Uh, and I believe that um, NASA has also laid out uh, an interesting uh, executive summary called the Moon to Mars Executive Summary uh, Objectives. And in, in that particular uh, summary, they talk about stepping stones or milestones of, of progressing further and further off into space. And I think, one of the things that I was particularly happy to see is that NASA is saying we need to test the hardware going to the to Mars on the moon before we go to Mars. 
Uh, and that's a very important point. And the, the, the space stations that we're building are actually going to be stepping stones to that same hardware. We're, we're, we're basically taking baby steps, if you will, initially, but those same modules and capabilities will ultimately evolve into both lunar modules, both on the surface and in orbit around the moon, and ultimately uh, for the, the Mars uh, exercises. So uh, I, I think there is a romantic opinion about Mars being uh, very, very much like Earth. And I'm sorry to say that's not true. Mars is more like the moon than Earth. And you can express this in numbers if you want, uh, but the fact of the matter is Mars is extremely hostile environment. And if we don't take care to make sure our systems, our support systems are working well, we're gonna have some fatalities. Right. You know, got to be cautious about that. Absolutely. Uh, everybody, it's about uh, 10, 16 Eastern time right now. Uh, we did get quite a few questions, and I'd like to maybe if you were interested or willing to go about another five minutes or so uh, to get a few questions, uh, a few additional questions answered. Uh, for those of you, I do encourage you to take a look at the chat uh, there were a lot of questions that were submitted that our panelists uh, have answered directly in the chat. So I don't think I'm going to spend uh, that much time on those. But uh, I know there was a question about Bigelow Aerospace. There was a question about the comparison between the, the Chinese space station and the ISS. And Vanessa has posted some uh, links about the interiors there. So I encourage everybody to uh, to take a look at those. But I did want to uh, ask a question that uh, was asked a, a number of times in the submitted questions uh, about artificial gravity and, and are there plans at all to do anything with artificial gravity, such as spinning the space station or even testing out the concept of it? Uh, so I don't know if anyone would like to try to answer that question. Uh, within the framework of the commercial LEO destinations project, I haven't heard that any of the, those participants are uh, talking about uh, artificial gravity uh, aspects to their station, but that is certainly uh, something for which there is interest. There was supposed to be a variable gravity centrifuge uh, installed on ISS, for which there was a great deal of scientific interest, but at the end of the day, it was axed for budgetary reasons. So within this particular framework, uh, no, but if you go on to inside NSS, uh, there is one of our members posted a story therein uh, to a separate commercial space station project, uh, I, and I believe the name is VAST, um, that, that is their plan to create uh, an artificial gravity uh, space station. I forget who uh, posted it on the platform, but I would encourage NSS members to, you know, sign in to Inside NSS and you know, see what's there and share your discoveries about space. Great. Thanks, Jim. I see Larry and Stephen have their hands raised. Are they uh, related to this topic question or is it another question? Uh, related to this question. Okay. Just a, a quick word about the, uh, the current level of understanding uh, and experience is based on the International Space Station experience. However, uh, as Jim was pointing out, there is a lot of interest in artificial gravity systems in the future, but I would observe that it's a more challenging design uh, activity 
than what we currently have experience with. So uh, some additional work needs to be done uh, on proving just exactly how we want to do the structure of a rotating, large rotating space structure. Um, there, there are some issues about um, maintaining structural integrity that are critical. So we will, we will get there uh, eventually. The question is, is how long will it take? Great, thank you. Larry, is your question re related to this or? Yes, uh, yeah, like I, uh, like I said, rotating. I, uh, one of the things that got me interested in space is uh, 60 years ago, people remember 60 years ago, the movie 2001 came out. And the thing is, uh, having uh, uh, these people walking around in the space station uh, up there. Also, I, I kind of think going up to the space station using Pan Am was a kind of a cool gimmick. And I says, and the guy making a phone call using AT and T on the thing. These are routine things that we should be seeing by now, but we don't. Great. Let's see. I see hands from Dale and Mark. Dale. Yeah, I wrote an answer to the artificial gravity can't answer, but it got eaten somehow by the system. Uh, there are okay. at least three companies uh, who have more or less serious plans to build artificial gravity stations. The one that I like the best is Vast. They have a website. Uh, they have a fund, a funder who has two and a half billion dollars. They have 50 SpaceX engineers. They're already testing the reaction control system to rotate the station. They're intending clearly from the design to use modules that have been launched on Starship. Um, so I take them pretty seriously. I, I wonder about their business plan a little bit, but that's a long story. There's another company called Grav Gravitetics, uh, which looks to have a serious uh, proposal or idea. And whether they have money or not, I don't really know. And then there's uh, Orbital Assembly, which I think definitely has less money but they certainly have thoughts. So, I mean, people are trying, but I, I, I honestly, I, you know, I, I, you have to take VAST seriously. They probably have more money to spend than any of the companies talked about tonight. So, well, you know, we'll see what happens. Right, and it's a, it's a fascinating question because so many people ask about it. So, uh, Mark, did you want to add anything? Yeah, just real briefly, if we're in space 2.0, I think that Achieving um, artificial gravity in space would be kind of a space 3.0 level of technology. We'll get there someday, but when we do, it'll be a real achievement. Right. Uh, let me just take a couple more. I saw a question from uh, Rich, uh, and uh, it ties into a question or a comment I saw, but there's going to be a lot of stuff up there in space. Uh, so the question is, how much risk is the space junk environment to the safe operation of these orbital habitats? Anybody want to try that one? I would say there's a relationship between the risk and the maneuverability of the stations uh, in the amount of time uh, in terms of advanced warning time that they would require for anything and the other risk would be as more items get deployed that increases the uh quantity of things that have to be tracked and, and it's a question of whether or not our existing systems are up to the task of tracking plotting uh and then providing uh, alerts. Uh, we've got a real world example just the other day with the FAA uh, NOTAM system whose purpose is to, before a plane takes off, it tells the pilots, okay, here are what the hazards are. Um, so having highly reliable fault redundant systems that can track uh, particles uh, down to what is perceived as a certain minimal size that can cause damage will be uh, an aspect of all of this and the aspect of the risk of operations for any uh, human inhabited facility that's in low Earth orbit. Yeah, uh, Bert, don't forget. Yes, to, sorry. Don't forget two weeks from now 
we have a program on space debris. Yep, yeah, that is correct. Everybody stay tuned for that. Very good. I We're at about 1025 Eastern time and we've gone about 10 minutes over. So I, I think it's time to close things out. I do encourage everybody to take another look at everything through the chat. I will save the, the chat uh, so that uh, we have it for, for later. Uh, but a lot of great comments uh, in there. And also the, uh, the Q&A, our panelists uh, did just an amazing job answering the questions. And, and I believe you can see the answered questions as well. So, so take a look at all those. Uh, obviously, it, this has been a really interesting topic, uh, and I just want to thank uh, our presenters tonight. Uh, so uh, first, thanking Stephen for uh, all the great work uh, for the, for the uh, Space Ambassadors, uh, and Jim, and uh, Prathmesh, uh, Ken, Vanessa, Mark. Uh, really great job. It, 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 we really enjoyed it. There was just so much information you shared. And uh, I did get one question. Uh, I know we're going to be sharing the 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 recording, but uh, are you all interested, willing to share your copies of your presentation or not? You can let me know afterward, uh, and we certainly we can we can include that when we send out the uh, information because we're such great great stuff there. So again, thank you for for this. We. We would like to invite you back again to do something, another topic. It was so good. So, so we appreciate that. Uh, obviously, on behalf of my other colleagues, uh, Fred Becker, uh, who does the logistics for our space forums. Thank you, Fred. And Larry, my colleague, uh, who helps us uh, organize all of these speakers and topics that we have in the space forums. Thank you, Larry. And I, I want to give a shout out to our COO, Dale Scran. Uh, for joining us this evening. Uh, it's been a very, very enjoyable session. Uh, what I'd like to do now is just share my screen one last time uh, as we close things out. And we had interesting uh, participation from, I think, about seven different countries tonight, including Brazil, Zambia, India, Canada, China, uh, the UK, uh, so it really was a great international representation. So thanking again our ambassadors for their great job. And uh, for all of those of you who attended, uh, for those in our time zone, have a great evening. For those in tomorrow's time zone, and have a great day ahead. And of course, we're heading into the weekend. Enjoy. I encourage everybody to stay safe. We will see you again next week. Uh, for this present, the special pr presentation uh, on India's private uh, suborbital rocket, and then in two weeks, as Larry said, for uh, a space debris presentation, and we'll make sure you get all the information coming up. So again, everybody, thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you again soon. <laughs>